wanted to talk about the female pelvis from a chiropractic perspective, um, which I, I think of that as just a functional anatomy perspective. Um, first of all, thanks everyone for coming. I had a really fun time thinking about this presentation, thinking about the diverse group of experts we have here. It's kind of hard to talk to everyone from medical doctors to lactation consultants to physical therapists, but um, I'm hoping that everyone will get at least something out of this. Um, this is my little family, that's my husband Luke, and Jacob is three and a half, and Giles is one. And um, my dad's a chiropractor. I was born about three months before he graduated from Palmer in Iowa. Um, I have a women's studies degree from Mills College in Oakland, which is kind of my little space. I've kind of always known I wanted to be a chiropractor, but um, then I have women's studies, but actually, which actually completely informed the work I do now, and I absolutely love that. Um, I went to chiropractic school here in Portland, so I was really fortunate to live here. Um, and now I'm back in Nevada City, California, where I grew up and where my dad practices. So I get to work with him and work part time and be with my kids and my husband, um, who we're going to be married eight years this month. And um, I got to be born at home myself and have both my sons at home. The first one here in Portland, the second one in Nevada City. So here we go. Uh, that way. <laughs> All right. So, what's the root cause of dysfunction and pain? Um, in old-time chiropractic, we look at the physical, the emotional, and the chemical. Um, for the purposes of this talk, so physical, you know, obviously physical. Emotional is more like stress-induced issues of pain. Chemical is food and environment and toxins stuff like that. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, we're going to look at the physical and biomechanical reasons for why we have pain and dysfunction. Uh, the first thing is lack of movement. So like uh, something stuck in the body, stuck in the tissues. We call that hypomobility. The second is too much movement, which is hypermobility. And then the idea of the bone out of place, like, oh, I was out. Um, so this bone out of place idea is kind of an old time chiropractic manual therapy idea where they literally would take an x-ray and mark it all up and say, oh, you see the spine is processed, it's rotated, we'll look at the right side. That must be the root cause of your dysfunction, therefore, every time you come in, I'm going to adjust that spine is processed three times to the left, and you'll be fine. Um, some people still kind of do this, but it is a little bit normal. Uh, what is normal? So this is based on this idea that we have this perfect, normal body like Leonardo's man. That doesn't really look like me, that doesn't really look like a lot of people. Um, but so we like to focus on function because there is this great variation between us as people and with our bodies. And so, uh, for example, a person with scoliosis can have no pain, no dysfunction if everything is moving well, all the joints are moving, moving well in the body. Um, they're perfectly normal, no pain. So we don't know. I mean, maybe that guy was standing, Leonardo's man, could have had total of that pain because he had bilaterally locked sacroiliac nerve. We just don't know books don't tell us much. Um, so movement is what matters. Where there's lack of movement, that's where we want to look. You know, life is movement. So we, where there's um, a lack of movement, like say here, say this, this ankle is locked in, what's going to happen is it's going to, our body's a whole kinetic chain. It's going to cause these different rotations that go all the way up to the neck. So we have a lack of movement, something stuck. And usually on the opposite side or just above it, we have hypermobility, too much movement. That's what causes pain usually. So as practitioners, we want to ask people where their pain is, but we want to then ignore that and kind of assume that that's a reaction to what the underlying cause is. Um, the body doesn't want this hypermobility because uh, it can lead, eventually it's going to rub the bones too much. Too much movement rubs the bones too much. It causes a breakdown in cartilage, and eventually that will lead to a premature arthritis, osteoarthritis, and joint de degeneration. So the body, in its infinite wisdom, says, "Okay, we have too much motion here. Let's stop it." You know. So first, what it does is it causes hypertonic muscles and spasm. That's super painful. Again, that's usually not at the side of the locked joint or the initial tightness is usually on the opposite side or just above. Um, it will then actually lead to ligamentous changes 
um, and eventually tissue fibrosis of the area. So when we see all those great, you know, anatomy pictures of scar tissue, that's usually what's happened. It's a hypermobile area that has gone too long. Um, a, a disc herniation is a perfect example of a hypermobile joint. What's happened is, you know, at the base of the spine, we usually get it at L5, the fifth lumbar. What happens is it's just been moved too much, you know, usually because of some blockage down below in the pelvis. And so the joint, which is the, the cushion between the two, I mean, <coughs> the disc, which is the cushion between the two joints, actually ends up bulging and then eventually herniating. So the issue isn't the disc itself, the issue is what caused that segment to become hypermobile in the first place. Um, the bone is so, or the body is so wise that eventually, after it does this tissue fibrosis thing, it will actually grow bone towards each other, which is what a bone spur is, and fuse the joint from a bony point of view. So here we have a perfectly normal spine. This is obviously a cervical spine, the next spine. These dark spaces are where the intervertebral discs are. You can see in this normal person, you have that nice dark space that's because the disc is still intact. In this person, um, we know that probably this is a hypermobile area. This is the bottom of the neck. It's like hypermobile in everybody because it's the transitional area from the thoracic spine, which is really supported well by the ribs and things like that, to the cervical spine, which has all these joints, tons of movement, and this freaking heavy thing on it. Right. <laughs> so, so you can see the bones here actually growing towards each other. That is this bone spur or an osteophyte is a fancier name. And eventually when you see old, older people who have a lot of mobility, particularly women, you will see actual fusion of the joints. And then you have no pain. So our body is smart. So our body is smart in the, um, in the long term. It's just in that process of destabilizing, uh, um, harming the tissues, that's genius. So, um, what causes these hypermobilities <coughs> and quote fixations? <laughs> Structural issues. So these are things we're born with, like a short leg, uh, a congenital malformation of the joint itself, hip issues, sacralization, which is where um, you have the bottom vertebra fused to the sacrum in some form, the bottom spondylolisthesis, which is a fracture in early childhood where the um, but the vertebra actually slides forward. And it's in a cold fracture, it's called. There's, you know, you basically need an x-ray. Most people don't know about it unless we're treating them and we're going, you're not getting better. There must be something going on here from a bony point of view. Um, you also have, you know, history of injury or trauma, like a hard fall in the buttocks. This could be as early as, you know, early childhood that could cause this. Um, car accidents with the foot on the brakes or the gas where you get a, you know, translation up into the sacroiliac joints. Um, overstretching, etc. Repetitive microtrauma is something we do every day, a lot of. <laughs> so, like if you're constantly doing this in a job, or you're constantly lifting, or you sit a lot, or <coughs> you have just a little bit of a postural imbalance, a tight muscle that just kind of always pulls you to that side, that will eventually cause this imbalance. And then, of course, pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, which we all obviously love since we're here, um, where you have this natural hormone loosening. <coughs> Um, hormones loosening the joints that leads to a kind of a general hypermobility um, and then of course birth which sometimes can really hurt women um, as, you know especially in hospitals where they're confined to one position um, okay let's see any if you guys need to stop me with questions or if I'm going too fast or whatever just stop me um, so traditional manual medicine chiropractic osteopathy things like that looks at where the body's stuck and tries to mobilize it and soften that tissue. So this is why we adjust patients or we do t deep tissue like trigger point work or um, we do traction. Um, that works really well with the majority of the male population. But what I've found in my practice is that for women, it can actually be insulting. Not all the time, but sometimes. Um, especially with our pregnant and postpartum population where you have these big hormonal issues going on. Um, women tend to be just more mobile in their joints for made to have babies. And so we don't get usually, we don't always get those really big fixations, you know, big stuck joints. Um, we tend to deal with more mobile joints that interplay with hormones and this monthly dance <laughs> between instabilities and fluctuations in our tissues. Um, so this is where it gets tricky. 
because from a manual medicine point of view, um, and this is something, like what I'm sharing with you guys today is I didn't learn this in school. I didn't learn it in any of my seminars. I learned it in my own body. And, um, but, you know, my dad taught me some of the releases that I'll teach you and stuff, but, and then just through my own research. And, because most of manual medicine is unfortunately still male. It's kind of like the um, doctors finally coming out in the 90s and going, oh, actually, uh, women have a different series of symptoms before they have a heart attack than men, you know? Whoops, and it's not women. <laughs> so, um, so this is, again, you know, something I've been finding. So this kind of general hypermobility um, happens for, you know, just biologically for us, physiologically, and then also it's really exacerbated by hormones. Relaxin, everybody knows about relaxin. Well, um, what I didn't realize is that like even men have relaxin. <laughs> I thought it was just a pregnancy hormone until I started researching. And it peaks even in women who aren't pregnant just after ovulation and in the second half of the menstrual cycle. So for those of us who like notice, oh gosh, you know, my back's flaring up, and it, we kind of track it, it can really be because we have that extra relaxin in our system. And if we are prone to any sort of imbalance, it's going to be exacerbated at that time. So, um, like I get a lot of patients who come in, I was doing that, you know, the same thing I always do, but, you know, my back just went out. So, um, I can, that can really lead to pain. Um, so, even though with global hypermobility, um, which is kind of how I think of women in general, um, and some men, actually. I've treated some men who have the same thing. Um, we still usually have a tighter side. So it's not a, like a traditional chiropractic locked joint. But in relation to the scheme of things, it tends, we still tend to have a tighter side. Um, so that's what I really look for in my practice, and that's what I treat. So I just kind of think of it as like balancing this you know, water rate fluctuations, right? The best we can. Um, so I love the pelvis. It's just awesome. So, um, so I always really work on balancing the pelvis. In pregnancy, postpartum, it's absolutely key, but for everybody, it's absolutely key to try to balance this as best as possible. Um, there's really three major joints in the pelvis. You have these two sacroiliac joints. So there's one, there's two, here's your sacrum, here's your ilium, and your pubic joint. There's also the hip joints, but I'm not going to address those in this talk. Um, and so this is a really important area because um, it translates all the way from the upper body to the lower body. And these sacroiliac joints uh, are it. I mean, they really are. Something interesting that an um, orthopedic surgeon told me about once was when we were walking on all fours, you know, these sacroiliac joints weren't really weight-bearing. They were kind of floating up above things, which probably led for a lot fewer low back problems. But when we became upright, all of a sudden, they are translating this weight from the upper spine to the lower spine and back, you know, the opposite way. They're kind of like these key, you know, just like the suboccipital area. It's this key um, area of translation and transition. So, um, so here's a picture of the sacroiliac joint. <laughs> this again I love, right? Because in the old days, people thought, oh, those don't move at all. You know, we've looked at lots of dead cadavers, and there's absolutely no movement in the sacroiliac joints, right? Just like the cranial bones. Don't move. So, um, not until like some chiropractors in the 50s and some other people came through, they said, actually, you know, look at these motion x-rays of a person walking on a treadmill. There's movement. And it's like two millimeters four millimeters maybe, but it's there and it's, you know, in your body, just like cranial, you're like, it's big. <laughs> you know, it might only be a few millimeters, but it's big. So the other thing is that and for a long time, people never thought that this joint was a synovial joint. A synovial joint is a joint that has a sac in it, like around it, and then fluid inside of it, and so it pops. And it, there, so there's movement there. Now people are going, yeah, there is actually a synovial joint. And, it's half of the joint, so this area, and then this part is where all the ligaments attach and doesn't move as much. Um, so here's another picture of the sacrum. Um, again, that this rough area is where all the ligaments attach, and then that kind of smooth area is where the little the fluid is, and that's where we have more motion. The sacrum is really key again in in, um, in whole body balance, uh, and it's a in, in 
my training is really linked to the spina, where they say the ilium are more linked to the temporal bones. So if somebody, if you find a really big sphenoid issue, check the sacrum. If you find a really big sacral issue, check the sphenoid. But if you're like me, pretty much everyone has this. So <laughs> we'll, we'll have, we'll see in business. Um, okay, so the other big joint is the pubic symphysis, which um, is right there. It's a non synovial joint, supposedly, though I put them pop a lot too, so maybe that's going to be reclassified someday. It's anterorodial, so it means it's a little bit of movement. Um, and it's the big thing about this one is just like the front half or the back half of the um, synovial joints, it's really attached with a lot of ligaments. And those ligaments are really key in um, pelvic health. You know, I'm just realizing. Let's see how this works. So, um, how does the pelvis move? And this is the part that I hope you don't glaze over. I kind of thought about how are we going to, you know, should I talk about this? But it, I just think it's really interesting. Um, and I'll try to make it simple. And if you have questions as I go, just ask. Um, there's some really cool movable animations, like diagrams on the Sorola website. That I listen to a lot, but I might not since the website, like the computer's way down there. I might just talk you through it. It'll be fine. But if you want, you can go look at those later. Um, so the sacrum moves forward into nutation. So here's your sacrum. When it moves forward like this, that's what we call nutation. When it moves backward, that's counter nutation. It's pretty simple. There's only two things to remember. Now, when it gets a little bit trickier when you add the ilia in. When the sacrum moves forward, the ilia comes back. When the sacrum comes back, the ilia comes forward. Not too bad. Um, yeah, those are really cool animations, but we just won't pull them up here. Okay, so again, this is a little bit trickier. We call, for the purposes of classifications and talking about pelvises, we have names, they're called listing. Physical therapists and um, chiropractors. So when the ilium, so this is posterior ilium, pia, when the ilium rotates back, so again, that sacrum would be coming forward into mutation. We call that a PI, a posterior ilium. It is based in these posterior iliac, posterior superior iliac spines, basically the same iliac joint right here. So again, this comes back posterior inferior, PI, PI ilium. The sacrum goes into what we call anterior inferior. It will come forward at that same joint. So just remember, these are supposed to move opposite. And it's easy because it's P-I-A-I. Um, then the other side, so then the other um, malposition, we call it, is uh, anterior superior, right? The ilium is coming forward anteriorly and superiorly. And the sacrum would then be coming back posteriorly and superiorly. So you've got your A-S, P-S pelvis. Okay? Okay. Cool. You guys are good. So this is kind of, you know, and this is why I gave you guys slides. I wish they would have given us something like this in care practice, but we never did at my school. We do in other schools. But this is a really cool way, you know, if you ever do get to look at an x-ray, it's really easy to see, again, you know, what this person is dealing with. So, so when you have a PI pelvis, this is on the right side, um, the, the ilium looks more narrow, and this guy, the obturator foramen, is taller. So, this is an android pelvis. This is what a male pelvis looks like. Which is why it's important to balance pelvises before baby people have babies, because if somebody's locked into that, or has a tendency to be in that PI pelvis, both sides are one side, they're, they're going to narrow their pelvic outlet. So, that's one of the arguments for male therapy during pregnancy. Um, so here is a double AS pelvis. So you have both ilia rotating forward, so we're going like this. The sacrum's coming back, and these little holes, the obturator foramen, are getting less tall. So this is what a female pelvis tends to look more like. Are we okay with that? You also have um, an increase in lumbar curvature with this setup, which is kind of like the when I mean, you look at most women and we're like this way back type, right? So. Um, but that's, that's because of this configuration there actually is kind of makes, you know, you can 
make sense of it. So here we have a typical android pelvis where you have the narrowing of the ilia, the wider obturator frame, and again, it's rotated back into a bilateral both sides, posterior inferior PI sacrum, PI ilia. So here's, and here's the female. You get a much better pelvic opening there. So this is kind of some fun things. Um, if you have, um, so that's just what I've already said, the PI and the AI go together, the PS and the AIs go together. You tend to, if you, if you are kind of self, try to self-diagnose like I do all the time, um, so these are kind of some tricks of the trade. You, you usually stand heavy on your short leg, right? Now if, you're, um, if, you're, if your ilium is rotating backwards like this, that leg's gonna be short, right? Does that make sense? I should have put a slide in on for this one, but. So here's your hip joint, right? If your ilia comes back like this, you can just imagine that that leg is shortening. When it comes forward, that leg is going to lengthen. So, um, so that tends to be your short leg you stay heavy on, which is, you see I'm heavy on, which is your PI side. But some of you might be like, oh, I wish I'd be on this side, or, you know. Um, you usually cross your leg over your PI side. And your psoas tends to be tighter on your um, anterior superior side. And the PI side or the AI side tends to have the tighter sacro tuberous ligament. From cranial sacral people point of view, like, you know, we kind of treat what we find, but I really like going into the, my treatment informed about kind of what to look for, too, because, um, I don't know, I guess I'm just kind of clinical like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's look at some other players. Um, with the pelvis, right? So we have the joints, which as chiropractors we're like the most excited about first. Um, but then we have these ligaments, which with kind of the global hypermobility syndrome actually are really, really important. Um, they're kind of like the tethers of the pelvis. So if the pelvis is a circus tent, they're like the ropes holding it down. And they, they kind of let it move a little bit and they guide the motion a little bit, but for the most part they really try to keep that tent standing. Um, the muscles, of course, just move the joints, and the fascia connects and interweaves it all and it holds everything together. So, again, yeah, treating fascia is awesome. So, my very two favorite ligaments in the pelvis are sacro tuberous, right here, and sacro spinous, which is not. You can, oh, here. So, right there. And I love this picture here because you can see how <coughs> everything really is suspended, you know, in this configuration of being upright. And, but so, here's your sacro spinous. And here's your sacred tuberous. Not only does that hold in your whole pelvic floor, but um, these are absolutely key in pelvic health. Um, I have another picture because they're so cool. Um, so again, sacro tuberous. It goes from the sacro to the ischial tuberosity, and here's this, the, the sacro spinous goes from the um, sacro to the spinous process. There, what's that called? It's facing it right now. Sacro spinous. Is it the I'll think about it when I'm not giving a talk. <laughs> um, so again, the especially the sacro, talking about correlations, it's kind of fun to note that the sacrospinous and this is especially the sacro tuberous ligament, but both of these really correlate to the suboccipital muscles. Um, I had a really fun experience when I was shadowing my dad before I went to chiropractic school, and this woman came in totally dizzy. She'd been dizzy for days. And he came and he put an elbow in the sacro tuberous because he didn't find any restrictions in the upper neck and just sat there for a while and then she got up and she wasn't dizzy anymore because her upper neck released that quick when they just balanced it from the bottom. There's actually a whole chiropractic technique based on this ligament called the Logan Basic where they can hold it for like seven minutes. But, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, it's just a sacro tuberous ligament. Just well, there's some other stuff, right, that you do. That's interesting. Yeah, but it, that's, I mean, I just think that's interesting because it's, it's such an important ligament, you know, there's a whole technique off it. So, um, so, another key player I always look at is the psoas muscle, and probably everybody here is familiar with that. It attaches onto all the lumbar vertebrae on the front and sides. This isn't... This is a pretty good picture of it. Um, but it also attaches up to the thoracic vertebra, which most people don't really know about. And the other thing that tends to happen too, and I got to see this in a cadaver lab last year, which was awesome, but the psoas minor 
actually comes down in, and it actually attaches more on the um, pubic ray line. So it can really be an issue with pulling the pelvis out of whack. Um, yeah, you might palpate that. Sometimes I think people get it confused for the round ligament, but it's really the so is minor. Um, but a lot of people have, again, you know, just like the, the sacroiliac joints and the upper neck, this, this thoracolumbar junction is a really big issue for people. Um, and a lot of times when you have pelvic, that, this, is, this area can refer pain to the groin, to the, so, uh, the sacroiliac joints and to the hip joints. So if you're treating somebody's pelvis for a while and they're not getting better, you know, look up. And a lot of times, this psoas can spasm and do all sorts of things. And when it does, again, it pulls us into this hyperlordosis. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times in women, because we're dealing with this kind of global hypermobility, it's really just a psoas issue, you know. And so you release their psoas, and they immediately feel way better. So um, it's the second strongest muscle in the body after the masseter, which is pretty cool. It's the sit-up muscle. So again, if people are doing like the old-fashioned sit-ups, where you really pull yourself all the way up, you're strengthening your psoas quite a bit, and it, again, that can be a detriment um, to the pelvis. Um, the overshape. Yeah. But oh, yeah, and then you kind of keep it chronically tight. So things that tight, its main job is to lift the knee. So anytime we hike, we walk upstairs, we sit for a long time, it shortens. And the best, you know, it's hardest to, to stretch by yourself. But we'd give this pupil this knee on the stool stretch or you know, knee to opposite shoulder laying on your back, and that can get into there. But again, I don't, if anyone knows a stretch that's like <laughs> really good to get into the psoas, um, besides this, I would love to know because um, for the most part, what I found is the best way to do it is just to put manual pressure on it. Um, but it'd be great to be able to release it, tell people more things to release it at home. Um, again, this is a really cool got, um, animation of when the psoas is tight, what it does to the pelvis. And what it does, since you guys know ASPI, is it pulls that side into anterior superior. So when you have the tight muscle, it pulls that side forward. Mm. This will also work nice better. Another key muscle is the psoas muscle that I really look at in the pelvis. Um, piriformis. Oh, sorry, piriformis, yes. Um, it comes off the front of the sacrum and goes out to the top of the hip. And its main job is to externally rotate your foot. So when you kind of put your foot out to the side, that's what it does. Um, a lot of people will just come in and say, I have this pain right here. And what I've, it can even cause um, a sciatica because in like 20% of the population, the sciatic nerve, which is right here, actually goes through the, the piriformis muscle. So when that muscle is tight and spasmed, um, you can actually get a sciatica. And again, I think a lot of women who have sciatica, sciatica um, could just have this piriformis syndrome. And what I've found in my practice is that um, a lot of times it's these sacroiliac joints that are moving too much, that are unstable. What do we know with instability, right? If we have something moving too much, the body tries its hardest, hardest to brace it. One of the big, big muscles of the pelvis that braces is this piriformis muscle. So it's spasm of the piriformis. Why aren't your piriformis spasm on both sides? You know? Usually it's one side, so we know it's an imbalance. So would it spasm on the, on the same side? It would spasm on the side of hypermobility. Okay, so the opposite of the side. Yes, exactly. It would spasm on the opposite of the step side, generally. Now, it could be like a hypermobile hip, a knee and ankle. I mean, there's still some other things like, you know. But, but as a rule, it's spasm, it's spasm on the opposite side of the tighter sacroiliac joint. Or the, it spasms on the same side of the sprain or unstable sacroiliac joint. Um, I think that's... So again, you know, there's a lot of other muscles involved in the pelvis, but if you even just have a few in your tool belt, um, those are the big guys, those, those two ligaments, and these two muscles, and then the glutes you just kind of treat because they're like the entire pelvis. <laughs> um, and they're really key too. The quadratus lumborum, the hamstrings, the quads. Um, a lot of times too, what you'll find is the tighter erector spinae are on the side of that instability. I mean, it's just kind of this rule. And when you have something tighter, why is it tight? Our body is so smart. It's trying to stop that motion. So how do we help that the body decrease the motion in that 
joy and let those muscles relax. Um, okay, what are we doing? Um, Alrighty. So, you, you, you'll be able to ask questions later because after I give my talk, we're going to do a hands on section. I'm going to show you how to help you all these things. So, it'll be fun. Um, the round ligament of the uterus is something I also address. It goes from the uterus um, down to <coughs> the eye line and I think into the lady I do some of its fibers. Um, it's a cool ligament because unlike most ligaments in the body, um, it has muscular fibers because the uterus is muscle probably. <laughs> um, and so it can spasm and um, that's why it causes a lot of pain. It's hard to palpate until more like the third trimester in pregnancy. Um, and I'll show you guys my favorite way to palpate it. But there's kind of a funny, um, a funny like uh, formula from the chiropractic people, which is like you take the umbilicus and you make an imaginary line out this way, and you take the anterior superior leg spine, this kind of you know bump here, and you draw an imaginary line this way, and then you find it. But um, that always was a little bit challenging for me, so I'll show you the way I like to do it. Um, then of course there's so many other things, right, that cause pelvic dysfunction, and I'm sure a lot of other people here are going to really nicely address the more visceral ways and the fascial ways and the organ issues and the pelvis that can, can cause kind of pelvic pain and imbalance. Um, but that's like getting more lectures and time for ourselves. So the Webster technique. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Yeah, <laughs> Okay. Yay. Um, all right, so the Webster technique is, there's a Dr. Webster, he's a chiropractor, and he came up with this technique to help balance, basically the pelvis, in order for the uterus to have, uh, be free from constraints and help the babies get into good position. Um, it's kind of mm, tagged as the way to turn babies, you know, from breech position, and we don't really like to say that, nor is it like good from a bowel practice point of view. But um, what it is good at is balancing the pelvis. So what I tell my patients is regardless of if we get this baby turn, you're going to have decreased pain and an increased likelihood for a successful birth if we can get your pelvis balanced and moving well. And when I think of pelvic balance too, I mean, I'm thinking of like broad scope balance. If your pelvis isn't balanced, you know, I, I, I think of that in the broadest way of, of balancing emotionally, physically, <coughs> mentally, but through my lens of the biomechanical, physical point of view. Because um, that's what I work on with my hands. Um, so yeah, this is, and, it, and, and it's taught now by the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association and Dr. Jean Young. She's a really incredible resource. She's on the East Coast and she does like a Facebook page and she has a Pathways journal that it's not expensive to subscribe to. It kind of fills the place a lot for Mothering Magazine now that it's not around. It's, it's a pretty nice substitute. It's, it's definitely... Um, a little bit more. Uh, um, well, it's I'm, I tend to be a little bit more conservative in my approach than it is, but it's a really it has really great articles. And it's, she's I really respect her. Um, so what chiropractors would like to do, or manual therapists throughout time, is to come up with their little cookbook recipe and say everybody should just do it like this. Um, from a biomechanical point of view, Dr. Webster was great in that I came up with this recipe, but as I've been showing you with the pelvis and what happens with, you know, certain rotations and stuff, it's kind of like he just put together a lot of pieces um, that we now know about if you know about AS and PI and mm -hmm. what some of these muscles do. So, um, again, we're going to demonstrate this in a little bit, but I just wanted to talk you through it before we do. You have the patient lie face down, and you bring the, the heels to the buttocks. The hill that doesn't go as far in, it becomes, you assume, it's the posterior superior sacrum. Now, that totally makes sense to me because the posterior superior is rotated this way, and that tends to be the side of this tight psoas. Well, if your psoas is tight and this is all rotated, it makes sense that you know your psoas is kind of pulling in, that your heel's not going to come to the butt as well. Some women, when I'm checking them out, they have absolutely no difference. They're really flexible. And then you get to palpate, which is really great because, you know, cookbook recipes are nice, but what I say at the end here is like, 
learn the formula, learn these common restrictions, then remember that none of us are this Leonardo man, right? You get to just use your hands and feel. Um, but according to Dr. Webster, and what I have found for the most part is that that more resistant side, you can also kind of pull on the leg, the one that's harder to pull on, tends to be the, the PS sacrum, which would also be the long leg side. So if you like measuring leg length, that tends to be the longer leg. Again, I, <laughs> I don't really do that in my practice. For the most part, unless it's really obvious and just jumps out because I, that's pretty subjective um, in my point of view when you're measuring millimeters. Sorry, the initials are getting a little jumbly for me. So yeah. PS sacrum and AS ilium perfect would be the restricted leg. Exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but let me just reiterate that. And that's why I gave you the handout because this is like a quarter of chiropractic school, right? I mean, a quarter's worth of lecturing. Um, but yeah, so anterior, superior, the iliac rolls forward, and the um, sacrum comes back on that more resistant side. Those two always go together. Supposedly, two. yeah, yeah. I always do sometimes. Well, I mean, I don't like. I think sacrum's kind of fixated, but that ilium is one way or another too. In general, if things are moving well, that's what it. Yeah, once in a while they're totally jammed, and you'll find them both moving together and things like that. But, um, but in general, that is supposedly the way that they work. So yeah, if you were gonna test the the ankles to the buttocks mm -hmm. thing. Because I refer people for the Webster technique all the time as a yeah. midwife, but yeah. they're usually huge and pregnant, and I'm right. worried about the baby's position at the end. Yeah, great question. <laughs> the pregnancy question. Yeah. So I didn't bring mine because I flew up here from California. Um, but there's this, it's called a pregnancy cushion. It's made in um, Ashland. Uh -huh. And they're like 350, 375. So you would just do it on that. Yeah, and, okay. and my table also, I have a drop piece that I can raise a little bit. But with the pregnancy cushion, you can put more um, pillows underneath. And um, we can pull up the website later to show you guys if, if anyone's interested. It's a great tool. Moms love laying face down, especially like when they do any day. <laughs> They're like, I haven't been able to do this in nine months, you know? <laughs> it, has, it has a cutout for the tummy, and it has cutouts for the breast. <laughs> and you can just put it over a massage table, a chiropractic table, anything. They're fantastic. Well, well worth the money, actually. Um, yeah, but thank you. I, I, I wanted to make sure to mention that. And, and you know, and that, this is one of the purposes of my talk. I mean, I, I would love for you to refer to chiropractors, but at the same time, I want you to have the tools to know like what to check and things like that in case there isn't somebody available, or if it's, you know, a little bit more minor, if you can catch it sooner. I mean, a lot of times people don't go to chiropractors unless they like really walk, you know. <laughs> Except when they're pregnant. Sometimes they're better when they're pregnant because we take care of ourselves a little better when we're thinking we're taking care of somebody else, <laughs> right, as women. So, um, so, so yeah, that's what, that, get them on their tummies. It's really the easiest way. Um, after you, you check that and, and do the treatment, which I'll, which, you know, I'll show you while, uh, in the hands-on part, um, obviously we're not in the doing adjusting. <laughs> but as cranial sacral therapists, we all know that you don't need you know, to adjust, and a lot of times too with these pregnant women, um, adjusting can actually be insulting to the tissues because they're already so mobile. So you can do a lot without having to actually adjust. Um, then you, with the patient on their back, um, you bring your hands over the head. This is kind of another trick that Webster figured out, or maybe he stole it from somewhere else. And the top side, say, of shorter is the tight psoas side. Again, like that totally makes sense from a biomechanical point of view. If the tight psoas is pulling your hip forward and pulling your whole body down, that's going to be the shorter arm side. But it's a kind of a nice trick, and it's something that, like, you know, cookbooks are, are nice for a reason. <laughs> um, all right. So, history and signs of pelvic instability. It's something everybody's heard, right? Um, the patients will usually say, and there's actually a orthopedic sign for this when they go and go, it hurts right here. It's called Fortin Fingers Test. And it's supposedly the evidence of this way to prove that someone has sacral like, joint dysfunction. Um, but it usually hurts right in the joint itself. And I'm really focusing on the joints again because I'm a chiropractor and we tend to think that joints are the primary issue and then all the muscles and everything adapt to that. Um, uh, so anyway, they say it hurts right here. But usually it will radiate into the buttock, and it also can actually radiate down the thigh, usually in the back. Um, 
people who get the stuff in the front of the thigh tends to be more of the thoracolumbar junction and not psoas. It's called main syndrome, there's actually a name for it. So, you know, depending on where people are having their referral, um, you can kind of, but if it's down the back or on the side, especially the side, if it, you know, a long-term instability can actually really affect um, the whole side of the leg. Uh, so people think they have, you know, different dysfunction there, but it's just kind of that chronic, yeah. Can it extend all the way down to the foot or mostly? Yeah. Uh, not, well, mm -hmm. classically not. Mm -hmm. um, but again, with long-term, you know what I've found a lot of times in my practice, even if someone will come in with like really intense um, tailbone pain, but no trauma. I mean, really an instability that's long-term can go all the way down because as we saw from the ligament pictures at the beginning, they're all connected, all those muscles are connected, and when you have a pull on one side, you know, so, so while at our office we do an internal pubic bone, or tailbone move where you can go in and actually adjust it, I always say, let's do a three-time trial of just really get you balanced first. If we can do that, it takes the pressure off, and then people are usually happy because they usually don't really want the internal work. So, um, um, it also tends to be increased pain with stairs, heels, anything that goes up and down, um, walking, everything that you think should make you feel better, right? Yoga, stretching, um, walking. Uh, unless it's like flat, you know, it can really aggravate a, a pretty good instability of spring. Prolonged sitting can aggravate it because prolonged sitting flares the sacroiliac joints. Um, menstruation, of course, because you get the hormonal issues. Uh, people describe not only this pain here, but they also usually have like a catch or they feel like it's going to go out. There's some, some sort of instability. Like I had one patient and I say, I'm afraid to relax because the pain comes when I relax, you know, which makes sense, right? The joint opens up when you relax. Um, uh, the history is body work helps temporarily chiropractic adjusting, but usually within a day or two they go out again. Sometimes even that day, you know, it helps for a few hours. These kind of people love craniosacral work because they're so usually unstable that anywhere they go, even massage, can hurt them. Um, so, and again, that's kind of severe. There's a broad spectrum of these, but um, it can be, yeah. Let's see, anything else in here? Oh, so, and, uh, okay, so another way I like to look at is outcome markers is when you first, and when I say palpate here, it's like palpate with an outcome, right? Um, when you first palpate these landmarks in the pelvis, they feel bruised and really tender. To me, that's showing me that this is a long-term issue. It's, it's chronic. There's quite a bit of inflammation. So one of the things I tell my patients is one of the outcome markers we use is like, is when I palpate these, when I push on these in the future, we want it to get to the point where it's, oh, that hurts so good. You know, like that kind of massage. We don't want this like, oh my gosh, that feels bruised. Which is a majority of these people will have that. Um, and then there are lots of work, there's like five orthopedic tests that um, show this and they're, if you ever want to search, they're online. Um, but you don't really need that probably unless you're a chiropractor or physical therapist or something. So my treatment options, um, I like to balance the pelvis as best as possible. Um, I do that through the Webster technique, soft tissue therapy, cranial sacral, myofascial release, and chiropractic adjusting. Um, I also have them brace if it's really bad. So these have become like my favorite thing in the world. Um, that's why I gave you the handout on them. They're Made by the chiropractor in Portland or um, in the Midwest, Dr. Sorolla, and he's a man, but he figured this out, so that's exciting. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to meet him one day. Um, they are. This is not my size, but I'll show you. They, you put them on like this. I'm gonna put it on, but you put it on over. I mean, again, most women who have this, like, will say, "This is where it hurts." So you think, okay, and, and it's also where you get the little dimples. That's right over the sacroiliac joint. If you're lucky to have the dimples the dimples of Venus, or whatever they're called. So you put them on over the dimples. Mm -hmm. And then you tighten them down. Now, in a severe strain situation, which I actually had in chiropractic school due to a bad move, you wear this for six weeks, 24 hours a day. <clears throat> I haven't had to do that with hardly any of my patients except like two. Um, one was a big yogi. Yoga, especially um, Bikram, is really hard on the sacroiliac joints, and people who love Bikram tend to be really unstable because it's the only thing that stretches their joints, right? It's the only thing that gets deep into them. So, um, I just, if I say, I, I tell them, 
okay, if you have to do Bikram Panda, that's fine, but wear your brace, you know, at least support these sacred layout joints. What happens with the brace is that, um, we're okay on time, right? Yeah, we're not, okay, yeah, we're good. I have to 12, 30? 12, 15. 12, 15, oh, that's right, great, great. And I didn't know for sure. Yeah, and that clock's right? That clock's right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So even let's see. Yes. You have till 12.30, Heather. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, even with sleep. Yeah. Do you find it superior to like kinesio tape? Or yes, yes. definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, what this brace does is it takes the work. See, I put it on right now. I'm like, ah. Oh. And I actually brought a whole bag of them because I figure there's going to be a certain amount, like quite a few women, especially if you do heavier duty body work. You know, like sometimes I'll just wear this the week before I get my period. Or, you know, like now I don't need it all the time, but I wear it when I feel unstable. If I know I'm going to go on a hike that when I'm already, oh, I'm a little unstable, you know, okay. Um, what it does is it, it, it basically <coughs> takes the job of the ligaments. So when a joint moves too much, you strain the ligaments. So I describe it to my patients like, okay, you sprain your ankle, right? If you don't brace your ankle and it stays strained, you're going to be walking on a turned ankle. <laughs> all the time because those ligaments are damaged and unless you kind of support them get off of them put a brace around it or something they're going to just stay chronically stretched and what we know from a nervous pre system perspective is like the little proprioceptive nervous system which is what tells our body where, the, where it is in space that gets damaged in, in sprains so you can do all the therapy you want on a muscle and um, especially you know those glutes over the sacroiliac joint and stuff but Unless you kind of retrain the nervous system and the proprioceptive nervous system in particular to the ligaments, um, it's going to be a temporary fix. So, and, and even this, you know, when you have an instability too, it can be, you know, as women with our hormones and just life in general, I, it's hard to absolutely cure somebody of this instability, um, but you give them a lot of tools that they can deal with it and it doesn't cause pain. You just, you know, you can preemptively treat yourself before it becomes painful. So, um, anyway, these folks take the job of the ligaments, and they can take about six to eight weeks to heal. So, you just tell someone, think about wearing this for six to eight weeks. Um, I've had plenty of women, in particular women who are in their first or third pregnancies, you know, um, wear this pregnant. And some women say I actually can't really press it on the belly too much, and some women just wear them when they're taking walks, which is what I recommend, or when they're active, if they have a towel over they're lifting. Um, because when you sit with a pregnant belly, belly in particular, this is not comfortable. But um, it's a great tool for pregnancy, and then also right after you give birth, because if you're prone to any sort of instability, you have this like six-week window to really reshape your pelvis, right? Because all your ligaments are gonna be maximally stretched um, you're going to have tons of relaxing in your system and all these other hormones. So if you have an imbalance and you can really get to it those first six weeks, which most of us writers do with our babies the first six weeks. So it's, but if I try to give my patients tools before, so if I know they're really unstable before they give birth, they say this, just, you know, if you hurt it all after you give birth, wear the brace. Um, it's a really great tool. Yeah. Can you comment, or maybe you're going to get into this, um, on the... How an epidural would iatrogenically create an instability? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, I don't know the function of the epidural on instability, but what I would, I mean, we know it affects the dural tube and headaches and all that, so I would just assume that it would be from an inflammation point of view. You, that would be a really great research topic. But in terms of how it acts on the pelvic floor relaxing it, because right. you know the baby's cardinal movements are disturbed. Yeah. And so again, anytime we have relaxation, um, we're gonna get the instability increased. And then also <laughs> it's creating inflammation, which I haven't mentioned yet, but inflammation actually comes before spasm, right? Mm -hmm. So when we have something that's moving too much, we get inflammation. And look, I mean, people now know how bad inflammation is for our body, but I can tell, so, so to answer your question, you know, how epidurals um, could affect this, um, you know, I would, the, the loosening, like you said, and then the inflammation aspect. And um, the inflammation, again, is just a sign that there's too much movement, something's mm -hmm. wrong. 
And, and then this little cell will share. They'll show them, show them. They'll start local and then they'll get more and more and more. And before you know it, your whole pelvis hurts. Or your whole side down to your, your tailbone hurts. Mm -hmm. Within weeks. Yeah. Are you saying inflammation just from the standpoint of having a needle stuck through tissue? Yeah. Causing, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just one more question. It's just an insult to the body. Yeah. Yeah. Just a follow on question. I was just mulling over that benefit of releasing the tight muscles to get balance, but then you're also releasing more yeah. of the stability. So exactly. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, you're, that's why it's like, out of the both ends. It's totally, yeah, you're totally true. Is, this it, is true. the instability really benefiting from strengthening my Pilates or any well, other thing? Okay, so that's a great question. You know, so what she's asking about is, if you have an instability and it's tightened and you release it, are you just furthering the instability? And then, um, and then, would you, you do something like Pilates? Yeah, I get it from yeah. the sides of yeah. the balance. Yeah, the sides of yeah. The and that's, that you know, this is why I love like working with, yeah. I, yeah, totally. And this is why I love working with women because, I mean, don't we feel like this is our life anyway? You know, we're doing, we're juggling all these balls and it's like, okay, we're going to release this because it's tight, but that's actually just, you know, another ball in here because, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. You are, in a way, adding to the instability, but you're balancing. And that's the key. We need to have the balance on, you know, physical, every level, right? So, so if we're moving too much, fine. Let's move too much, but let's move too much all equally in every joint because then we won't have pain. You know, it, what causes pain is the imbalance. So, and that's why you can have lots of women at the end of pregnancy with no pain. They just don't have an instability. I mean, they don't have a, sorry, an imbalance. But if you have, like, well, again, a little bit tighter on the right, or say, oh, this the saw has a spasm on the right, or whatever, mm -hmm. that's when you start, you know, everything changes and adapts to that tight area. Um, and that's, that's so, what we're trying to correct. So with the instability, really, your, your goal is to find the best balance you can. In the exactly. Process. Yeah. Yeah. And strengthen from there, move yeah. from there. Yeah, all these variables that are completely out of our control and like fluctuating all the time, which again, I mean, to me, that's life, right? <laughs> so I love it. Um, so yeah, and as far as exercise afterwards, that's a great question. Um, Tammy Kent, who's speaking here later, had a really, um, she told me, Initially, like I don't want my women to do kegels until I get their internal muscles balanced because otherwise you're going to strengthen what's already strong and ignore what's inhibited, and what's weak, right? So I don't know if she still says that, but that's what she told me after I had my first baby. Um, so that's the same in the pelvis, and that's why I'm pretty um, tentative to recommend Pilates or um, even yoga stuff like that, unless it's pretty mild for the first part of really dealing with an instability um, because you're not, you gotta fix the balance and the neurology to the area first and turn on those muscles that aren't working and you know, get the spasm out of the things that are already too tight because otherwise you're just gonna strengthen what's strong and ignore what's inhibited. So I'm gonna ask one more thing. Yeah. And I don't know the term of this, but when the belly splits. So oh, diastasis recti? Diastasis, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, oh my gosh, huge for um, pelvic instability. Yeah. There's, um, I like what Carol's reference on that, Lose Your Mummy Tummy, which is an awful name, but that's a book and she has a video, <laughs> um, for, for at least strengthening, beginning to strengthen with that. Um, I, uh, it, you know, when that happens, you, you just, you're set back even a few more steps for the instability. Is that pretty common for yeah. most people? And, and what, you know, what you read is like it happens in women who are overweight and out of shape. Well, I think it happens in women who are in shape. I haven't. Yeah, I know. I still have a point to birth. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, diastasis recti is where the um, muscles that come you know, from here to here split open during pregnancy. They just kind of tear apart. And naturally, they should come back together, but a lot of times they don't. And then um, sometimes women get like kind of herniations out and things like that. It's just, and, and what I do find is that it's women who tend to be in better shape and their their abs are strong. So we tell people like, you know, when you're pregnant, don't sit up like this because that splits them. So like, roll to your side and come up well and all that stuff. And you can correct that with. Well, that's the lose your mummy time the book. Yeah, it's you know it's a lot of work with the trans, um, transverse abdominal muscles, kind of squeezing the belly button in. Um, and that it's yeah. 
she has a really um, intensive program. And that does contribute to instability. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Totally, especially with bending. Because you have absolutely no abdominals. How, and they're important for the whole thing. How do you know if that happens? Really you can feel it. You can pelvic mine later if you want. You press on the umbilicus and you have to do a little sit up, and you can feel it if you sink in. Can they go right back together? Yeah, supposedly. If you're local, there's a group in Vancouver called the Tummy Team, which is really amazing. Very cool. She's like, I think she's a piece of It's nice. I. It'd be nice to be able to like go to class for that. Yeah, because it's hard when you have a baby and you're like, okay, now I'm supposed to do my abdominal work and. Okay, so anyway, um, back to treatment. So it breaks them. I tell people to actually avoid deep stretching, especially external hip rotations, stuff like that, because a lot of people will say, oh, I just have to do these stretches, and it does help for a while, but it actually kind of increases the sprain. Um, you know, I kind of said this in a, a sex with legs wide apart. You know, I probably could have thought of a better way to say that, but that's the reality, right? So, <laughs> you know, anything that just kind of spread, spreads the pelvis. Um, and then and then also things like flip-flops. Mm -hmm. You know, flip-flops let your ankle move more, let your knee move more, and then your pelvis moves more. You know, so like dance goes or shoes like that tend to be good for people with more instability, um, is what I found. And this is, again, varies body to body. Um, and then kind of like sinking in that soft chair or couch for too long where everything's kind of right? Um, and then the other, so it's stretch with psoas, which we talked earlier about. Um, and then the other thing I give people that I love, that I, that I found when I was pregnant with my first baby, I forgot my ball. <laughs> I love those little like pink balls. Or you can use a tennis ball, so I got an apple for this. But um, what you do is you go through your pelvis and you sit on the ball and you start down at your tailbone, but come right off to the side. So in the tissue, so, so imagine this is your sacral tuberus and you want to get your sacral spinous and your piriformis and you can go all the way up. And what I tell people, I'm not actually, this is not my apple, but <laughs> you know, you start way down low like this and then you just sit on it and you sit on the floor or some harder surface because this will be too soft. And um, you can kind of bring your leg around, and it's the app, and then roll up to the next spot. If you can like watch a movie and, and sit on these points, and this will help everybody, you know, it's the best mimic you can do to like coming in and having me put my elbow in these. Um, you just roll up, roll up, roll up, and the longer you can sit on it, the better, because there's this thing called hysteresis and creating the tissues, which is that the longer you hold something, the more it will release. So. You know, if you're with your first baby or you don't have babies, just like watch a movie and go through the points and you know, five to ten minutes each point would be fantastic. If you tell them to go for the places that are tender or just yes. every place? Places that are tender, but it's pretty tender usually for most people. And if they say, oh, I don't feel it, I say get on a tighter, like a harder surface or also you can really just figure out with moving your leg around like this, so you really won't get on those spots. If you tell them to basically go between their sit, start between their sit bone and the tip of their tail bone. Exactly. Work your way up along. Yeah. Yeah. Work your way up. And I, I just went and bought a bunch of those pink balls and saw them in my office for what I bought them for because, um, because I really like them. Um, I found that's a nice size. Oh, okay. So actually, we get to change gears here. I just had to add this in because I think this is like super duper awesome. Um, when I was in chiropractic school, one of our teachers kind of flew through this thing where like, oh, there's a suboccipital that has a connective tissue bridge into the dermal nerve. Next slide, you know, and, and like, that was even before I started doing cranial work, but I thought, oh, that's really cool. Um, and so last year when I was doing this eight hour cadaver lab continuing education thing, I, he had a Q&A at the end and I was like, have you ever seen this connective tissue bridge? And he said, yeah, actually we have this hemisection of a skull, let me show you. And I didn't take pictures, <laughs> but it was, it's, it's there. And actually when I started searching online, there's a whole journal in um, Spine Magazine. So here's the reference for it, in case anyone wants to look it up. It's online, you can download the PDF. Um, so what it is, is it's this rectus capus posterior minor. So I'm just introducing this in that, like, I'm looking at the power areas, right, of the spine. So for me, the power areas are the pelvis, particularly the sacroiliac joints, the thoracolumbar junction, and then obviously, you know, the um, base of the skull and the top of the neck. Um, 
So this rectus capitis posterior minor, it's right there, attaches to the first cervical and to the spine, I mean to the skull. And this is kind of a funky picture, but here's the muscle, there's the connective tissue ridge, there's the dura monitor. <coughs> I have two more pictures to show you. This is a fresh tissue specimen. Oh gosh, it's hard for me to see here. But here's the muscle, here's the dura monitor, and there's the bridge. See those little bridges? Wow. Whoa. Yeah. So for any doubting person, for any doubting person who's like, what are you doing with cranial? How can it affect the dura? It's like, well, from a purely biomechanical point of view, there's a connective tissue bridge that pulls on the dura that the dura is a sheath around your brain, and obviously any pull in your brain isn't so good <laughs> from a nervous system point of view. I like to have things so I can explain it. My my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law are doctors, and he's a general surgeon, and my husband's a Stanford PhD biologist, so I'm like, I gotta have, you know, I, for my own sanity, I have to be able to explain what I'm doing to them. <laughs> um, but so here's that other picture. So again, this is the connective tissue bridge. Yeah, isn't that incredible? It's like, this and what was the link? Could you point that out again? Yeah. I can't see that on the I know, it's picture. hard. So here's, here's the rectus capitis posterior minor coming down. Here is the number four is the spinal dura mater. And here's the bridge. See those three little arrows? That's the bridge. Can you go back to the previous spine because there are the <coughs> side that mm -hmm. and because we can't read the um, Oh oh the, that, you can't read the you can't read it. Oh, dang. Yeah. Is that online or just in the This is all online. I was not creative by mine. Oh yeah, sorry it's so little. You know I can leave this slide up at the end too. And you can just search spine 20, 23, and with the, one of the, um, spine is a journal, it's a, it's a, it's a like, really well-respected medical journal. So the fact that it's in there too is very awesome. Um, and, and who doesn't have some occipital muscle issues, right? And most people will come to you and say, I have a tension headache. Well, from the biomechanical, like, manual therapy point of view, you can ask any MD and they'll say tension headaches are due to the suboccipital tightening and the referral pattern is it comes around and it eventually gets to behind the eye. Um, it's one of the headache classifications that's well known in the medical world and so then you go, oh goody, so you know about that? Well, <laughs> there's this connective tissue bridge into the dura, did you know about that? Here's the reference. Um, are people done with that? So there's, and then I have one more picture of that. It's so awesome. So this is a dry specimen. Here's the muscles. Look at how meaty that bridge is. You think that person had some suboccipital tension? Here's the dermar. Wow. Wow. Yes. So super awesome. Can you get these pictures anywhere? Yep, they're online. Like, I, my whole presentation basically, except my family photo is, is totally, and that's it's in my thank yous. Don't worry. Um, so, so the hands on, we're going to do that next. And we're going to go through these things, but before we do that, I wanted to just say this because we might get distracted. Thanks to my dad, Dale Jacobson. Um, he's got a really great website, jacobsonchiropractic.net. He's been doing this, well, 35 years. And um, he also wrote a book for, for patients, which is really awesome because a lot of people kind of dream of this but don't do it. Um, half of it is uh, yoga stretching that we give for um, rehab, and then half is nutritional essays, everything from gut flora to um, composting to milk and raw milk and, you know, um, cholesterol, a lot on why cholesterol is actually good for you. Um, so that's fun, and it's also going to be available online um, pretty soon as a Kindle book for like 10 What I like to okay. do when I first have someone on the table is just to feel their pelvis and their sacrum. Mm -hmm. And if you can kind of feel, like with Carol, right away, her left side just feels like it's higher. Again, like, I don't like the whole bone out of place, but this is just, you know, this is just helping us get, get our grounding. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, I like to change places. You see, I guess it's the same on the other side, right? Because the way we help it, oh yeah, okay, good. You know, can be like, maybe it's the heel of our hand on that, you know. Um, but yeah, so. Then you just come down, and this is a little too cute. 
but just both heels to the butt. Oh yeah, good. Once in a while we're not, right? But you can see as I push down both sides that this left side isn't coming down as far. Um, now that does everyone want to just do that? Let's just do it. Let's just all stay together. Because I like and once in a while, so, so, you know, if they're, they, she, so she's like 20 even? So, so you know, if somebody's pretty equal, you can do a few things. You can look at their leg length and equality. Remember that that AS side will create the longer leg. You can also kind of, you know, pump them a little bit. So, you know, push them in a little bit, maybe. Okay. Yeah. But um, and then kind of when you do that, sometimes and again, if if really it's equal, um, it tends to be that the whole top of the sacrum is just posterior. You know, and again, it's like this is fun for a, a cookbook, but just if, if it's if you're getting confused, just just feel it. You know, and I always treat both sides anyway. So the so, constricted leg is coordinated with the posterior sacrum. And you can see on Carol's oh, she's already swung around a little bit. That's not looking at Carol. She's kind of sacrum. Yeah. Yeah. Is she tighter on her left side? Yeah, yeah. So you can see here, you know, that this this side of the sacrum is up. It's it's a gross, you know, it's a gross thing, but um, so, so after I test that, and that I just make a note of, okay, she's posterior on the left side by two inches, so I just say PS plus two. Um, then what you do is you find the tailbone. So does everyone know how to find the tailbone? Personally, I'd love to. Yeah, okay, so. Yeah, and it's, so you just kind of follow the sacrum down. <laughs> if you don't want, you know, it's just. Yeah, the coccyx. Yeah, the coccyx. So you just kind of sink down and find that coccyx. And then you come off to one side or the other. So I like to do it with both my thumbs at the same time. So here the coccyx is right in between. And you just sort of, the imagination is you scoop up. Kind of uh, towards the head from the tailbone. And I can go around and help people. And this is finding that sacred tuberous ligament, right? So, are you right off of it? Let me get it. Let me get this time and I'll show you. And again, you can kind of imagine this to start with and you'll just start feeling it. But so I just kind of, so this ligament goes from here to here. No, here to here, I'm sorry. This is just one more doing. So we're just kind of scooping up. Right? Just lengthening it, you're lengthening it. Heather, could you just turn towards oh, the camera and just do that a little again? So, so the ligament goes from here to the sacro, to the ischial tuberosity, and you're scooping that inward. Great. Yeah, this is, so the first part is where the nerve release that ligament. On the restriction well, again, I don't go in. Yeah. But I can draw releases with this. Probably. Um, so what I then you do, and I can kind of, well, I'll just kind of walk through it quickly for those of you who are um, a little not feeling it. We'll come around after. So don't forget. Um, it's then I, the side I'm on, I literally just take my elbow and I push it through. Yep. And then I just hold it for a while. And, and as a cranial person, I like to kind of feel what the upper, you know, the upper pelvis is doing. You can kind of start adding things to it. But um, <coughs> where's the direction of force of your elbow? It's kind of it's it's same as what you're doing with your thumb. Exactly. Right. So and then you're taking a scoop. Like the traditional people do is not like I scoop it, but I'm not always my thumb. Great. Sorry. I love my hands, but I need it here. 
Do you do which side do you choose? I do both sides. Mm -hmm. But the tighter side, again, should be that AI side. But again, it really doesn't. Yeah, and then the Do you wait for a specific release? Yeah, you'll feel it soften. So again, the old Logan Basic people who did this, like, the people that like 10 minutes. And they would go up each same one of the and you'll feel the tissues release. And then there's a big connection, and you can actually hold the battery. You know, so that's why the snacks are really nice, and then feel the pulse at the same time. Are you able to hold it? Yeah, the same spot. Again, this is a lot more force than what we do with cranial work, but you can do the same sort of thing. You'll just feel, yeah, you'll feel the, you'll feel the tightness, and then you just go into the tightness. And like, Carol's kind of like, you know, and then, you know, you switch sides. So ergonomically, it's best if you come around your table. That feels and the other side. Um, actually, so while I'm on the same side, I will go up and do the piriformis, the sacral spine is the piriformis, and the glutes are over the same really high So, you start with the um, the, the sacral tuberous, then you make it move up to the sacral spine, which is just right above, and you'll feel the fibers, you know, eventually doing that. And we should, we should, you know, you'll have the pictures on the slide, so you'll see. And you just hold that. So remember, these are ligaments. They're really tough. They don't have much blood supply. They're holding that tent up. So we need to, just, you know, it's helpful to really get in there with some force and really force the lungs. Yeah, it's really pretty easy. <laughs> and then once you start getting better, you can start feeling the way. Um, their pelvis wants to move around. So you can add in the hip. Yeah, you can add in a cream that's going to be special for the body as well as the body. And so then you go up. I was going to say. 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 So then you come up to the piriformis muscle. And the piriformis is kind of just just under, like, if you cut the sacrum in half, just a little bit under that. If you want to get fancy, you can kind of do this sort of thing, and you'll feel it tighten. Again, it really doesn't matter. You just go to what's tender, and you'll start feeling what's tight afterwards. You know, you can have your place and talk you through things, but then you just hold up. And again, if you want to hold that other hip, and say, oh, she's okay, fine, now she'll come back with me. Do you find that you, <laughs> as the muscle releases, that you, you'll shift slightly your position on your elbow in order to facilitate that? Yeah, exactly. And, and like, I'm I trying to explain like, to this is more advanced, but like, if you grab, you know, the front of her pelvis or whatever, and just see what her sacrum, but, you know, because like in my fascial work, how things kind of start doing all the time, or cranial work, you know, and start really open, you can just kind of follow that motion and exaggerate it. And then eventually you want to come up to right over the sacroiliac joint, which is more the upper glutes and the glute means and stuff. And those will probably be really tender over the sprint, or more unstable joint. But again, you just you say, okay, let me get you to like this seven out of ten pain, but no more, and you just hold there. <coughs> And if you had a little higher table, you can do this more ergonomically, but um, it's pretty simple, especially. And the big thing is don't move around your elbow when you're already in the tissue. That hurts people, and it's just insulting to the tissue. So find your spot that you want to push on, and then just hold it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to Like, we're increasing the inflammation here anyway because we're forcing those tight fibers to break apart. But, um, but getting them and moving around will just be like, not good. So. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna leave you just um, half big. I'll do the other side after. <laughs> um, but then, you know, so while they're still, and then I, in my practice, I'll go up the spine and feel for any other tightnesses and do a little adjustment, usually in the, you know, mid thoracics. And then you come back through and you retest, and we should see how she feels tighter on the right. So that's okay. We look at the left. Then you just go back and retest it. 
And again, that's, you know, kind of a gross test, like, it's not, but it's a good guide mark, and once in a while you'll get people with like a six inch difference of where they are. And it's just kind of a nice way to gauge, like, see if they're um, shifting around. Okay, so that's what you do on the back. So we'll go, you guys, after this, I'll, um, I'll circle it around and I'll help you me. And then, and then we'll have them flip over. Yeah. When you're here, take them down. restrictions probably all the way down. So then what you do is you just bend their knee up, stand on the side you're working on, and find their anterior superior iliac spine, which is this little bone right here. So remember that the piriform, or the psoas, comes from the bottom of the thoracic and all the lumbar vertebra. So it starts about here, you know, a few inches above the belly button, and it will start there and will come out to the, the you know, the thigh bone, the top of the femur. So, if we imagine the muscle fibers running like that, what I do is I, I, I just tell you that, because you could actually work on it all the way up and down. On a pregnant woman, you just do the bottom part. Um, and, and a lot of people will be scared to push in deep here, especially on a pregnant woman. The baby will get out of the way, and the mom will love you. This was something in chiropractic school when I was pregnant with my first baby. I had to go to the clinic, and my intern, I was like, because my dad had taught me this release when I was young, and I was like, you got to do this, and she's like, I can't do this, I was doing like two or three weeks, and I was like, you got to do it, and I, it was, you know, really felt great, and then when I went to the Webster Technique training, they taught that too, which I was very impressed with, so if you just kind of move around the knee and feel, you know, about an inch in from that Lips, superior leg like spine, um, and you just imagine the fibers are kind of running this way. And if you if you are confused too, you can have them push up into your yeah, up into your hands, like raising your knee because that's the action of the muscle, muscle, and you'll feel it come into your hands. Do you feel that? You might need to do a little bit more. Wow. So then what you do is you, with a broad contact, because anything, anything poke, you know, one finger, two fingers, is going to be too pokey. So you try to go in with like, you know, three or four fingers at a time. Just go in. And they will, a lot of time, and then you can feel, is it the psoas, is it the iliacus, they're all joined there, sometimes it's more iliacus, sometimes it's more psoas, who cares, it's tight, let's get it released. And this is so good ergonomically for your body, I mean, you literally, and this is something like, when my pelvis sacks up, I just tell my husband to do this to me. A lot of times, because husbands are too, um, or trained husbands, so um, a lot of times they don't feel comfortable going this deep because they think they're hurting their wives, but it feels good. So good. And again, then if you get, if you can kind of turn on your cranial sacral line with your deep palpation, you can go, oh wow, okay, with this pressure, you know, this muscle wants to your hands in sway. So then I hold that for a while. A lot of times it will be pretty dang painful for the patient, and I say, that's all right, I'm just getting you ready for labor. 
It's a different kind of feeling than we usually have. Um, yeah, you can, if they're squeamish, you can move their knees around and distract them. If it's not super tight, you can start lengthening, and it will put more of a stretch into the muscle. And then you just do both sides. So, um, the next thing, and then you can remeasure the arms and all that if you want. The next thing um, that you look at is the round ligament. So, with the Webster cookbook, and again, this will be in your notes, the side of the posterior superior sacrum is the side of the tight psoas. This is in your notes. Because that psoas is pulling it forward, or maybe there's something else first. Um, but we really spoke psoas is. And then what they say is then the opposite side round ligament should be the tight one. The round ligament on the PI side. Yeah, it makes sense. So, um, so, it, well, you know, it didn't, honestly, I practiced for like two years before this made sense. Um, because the, 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 the tight side is not the red side that's written is back. So it's just putting more strain on the pelvis. On the, on the uterus, be doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so again, there's this like formula. I should have put it in the slide to find it, where you go from the umbilicus and you make a 45 degree line down, and then you go from this and you make 40 and where they cross. That's what I'm going to mention. We don't have a really pregnant person here, so it's going to be really hard. It's pretty similar to where the psoas is a little bit. It's more internal. Um, but what I suggest with this is do it in harmony. So sit up at the end of the table for me. This is for me the easiest way to do it. And I was in Carol's class on pregnancy growth and postpartum when I was seven months pregnant with my second baby. And she did this on me. And I was like, <laughs> so you really get under the tummy, you know, around the very pregnant belly. And I usually reserve this until the woman is having my heart at least. Until the woman is um, just about due. Because they get in that nice space where they start relaxing, and you can just say, oh, let me just hold your belly for you for a while. And when you get in like this, you those round ligaments jump out like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of right there, too, where your fingers come around. And I don't know if, if people have taken Carol's class for this, um, but you just, I mean, you basically just hold the belly. And the uterus will do this incredible unwinding. And especially, um, so we can see so like your arm. Not oh, okay. Well, I don't have a pregnant belly. I know. <laughs> I got a little belly. Mm -hmm. So I just get, you know, way down low. Yeah. So I'm not being pregnant. That uterus is down. Just yeah. yeah. So I'm not sure. It's so like your postmenopausal. Yeah. Like but but this, yeah. is, this is more before pregnant. I mean, you're not going to palpate around like a so I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. And so the third trimester. Yeah, this is specifically for. Big belly. For a big belly. So you're not going to palpate those really until the third trimester, and you just literally um, let them do, you just, I mean, my intention at this point is like, okay, I'm just going to hold this for you. I'm going to hold this weight. I'm going to support your process. And then they, their uterus, especially first time moms, so cool because they're so tight in their sizes and they're low, got, um, low uterus. They just, I mean, really start twisting all over the place. And that, Uterus feels really nice, and from like when, she, when Carol did this on me, it was like, oh, somebody's helping me, you know, somebody's holding this for me and supporting me in a really neat way. Um, so again, I don't do this on all my visits because my visits are 20 minutes. So, but when a woman gets towards the end and she starts getting to that quieter place, then I'm like, oh yeah, she's ready, <laughs> you know. And then if she needs that advice, I can refer her to somebody else that will spend an hour and a half with her. <laughs> but this is a nice way to finish off a treatment. And then, of course, I always really address the suboccipital and the sphenoid and the temporal bones because that's so related to the pelvis. Um, but you guys all know how to do that, probably. And, um, and I, so what I would rather workshop with you is just coming around and really helping people feel comfortable palpating the, the sacral tuberous um, and the, the psoases. Because the rest of it you can kind of pick.